If you're having a bad day, he can really raise you back up, you know? A 50-year friendship that inspired a hit movie. Individuals got a special need. You know, they're just like you and I. They should be treated with respect. Meet the real radio, played by actor Cuba Gooding Jr. Plus, a deadly diagnosis. How do I tell my little boy that he's not coming home? See what brought one missionary back from the dead, all on today's 700 Club Interactive. Well, welcome to the show. James Robert Kennedy is 72 years old, and he's been a junior at T.L. Hanna High School since 1970. James is also a permanent member of the Yellow Jackets football team and the inspiration behind actor Cuba Gooding Jr.'s role in the movie Radio. Take a look. Meet Radio. He's a bit of a legend here in the small town of Anderson, South Carolina. At 72 years old, he's still in the 11th grade, and he wouldn't have it any other way. Every year they take a group picture in the gym of all the seniors that are graduating that year. He will not get in that group. He said he knows he would have to leave. Not only is Radio a student at T.L. Hanna High School, he's perhaps the most revered member of its football team, the Yellow Jackets, even though he's never played a second of football. I think it was just God's plan that put radio right down there on that practice field. It was 1964 in the heat of August when JV coaches Harold Jones and Dennis Patterson noticed a young man coming to the practices every day holding a transistor radio to his ear. He started mimicking us, coaches and the players. And so we were trying to get him to come closer to us. We wanted him to get involved. So we said, well, let's, let's get off from a, a Coke, maybe, and a hamburger. And maybe we can get him good. And that was the trick. They learned he was 18-year-old James Robert Kennedy, nicknamed Radio because of his obsession with radios. In today's terms, he was born with an intellectual disability and was unable to learn how to read or write and could barely speak. But the coaches and players saw past that and soon made him one of their own. He wanted to be like the coaches and all. I was a defensive coach, so I'd give the sign, you know, and he'd do the same thing. And then every once in a while, if I, you know, got mad at an official, you know, he'd get mad at an official. Radio would become a permanent member of the team, going to practices, giving pep talks, and leading them onto the field before games. Radio really loved those guys out there, you know, and, the, and the coaches. He'd do wind sprints, and you know, they, they loved it. He just grew a part of them. He came from a rough neighborhood across town and lived with his mom, stepdad, and younger brother, who was also intellectually disabled. Radio loved going into town, perhaps to escape the ridicule and bullying from kids in his own neighborhood. Their mother, you know, she'd worked two jobs. She worked in the hospital, and then she did housework. And her biggest concern was these two boys, you know, keep them out of the institution. Well, I told her, we'll take care of radio while he's at the school and everything, don't worry about it. So in 1970, the coaches arranged for the 24-year-old to enroll in Hannah High School as a junior. Radio was ecstatic. I think that saved his life, being able to be out here at Hannah. He was learning all the time. But the community at Hannah High School would soon realize that what they got from radio was more than what they were doing for him. He loves to give hugs. I mean, if you're having a bad day, he can really raise you back up, you know? He's just part of our family. Like you say, I think the good Lord caused all that. This wasn't the first time Coach Jones reached out to someone who needed friendship. I had a, something in my heart for people like that. It was a kid about my age who lived across the street from him. A lot of people would pick on him. So I kind of defended him, you know, and he was my friend. I just think it was the right thing to do. In 1996, Sports Illustrated writer Gary Smith penned an article about the friendship between Coach Jones and radio. From there, Hollywood director Michael Tolan brought their story to the silver screen in the movie Radio. When I'm answering an email, I always put down, you know, if it's a student, I say, well, please find a 
student has special need in your school and become their friend. Individuals got a special need, you know, they're just like you and I. They should be treated with respect and everything like we want to be respected. When Coach Jones retired in 1999, his biggest concern was whether his successor, Terry Honeycutt, and others would take care of his dear friend. He didn't have to worry long. They stepped up to the plate, each one. They love him. They want to be part of him, you know? They just, I mean, radio's a radio. Man. He's a man. One nation. Today, that friendship continues, and at Hannah High School, you will still find that same 11th grader greeting everyone with a smile and a hug and cheering on his beloved Yellow Jackets. From radio, a young man who couldn't learn how to read, write, or even play a sport comes a lesson we all need to remember. People with special needs, you know, they, they give us more love than we can actually return. Now, this is a lesson for us all. They can give a lot of love and they can give a lot of hugs. What a wonderful story. It is a wonderful story. And you know, I, I, I was struck with the fact that it all started with what Coach said. We noticed mm -hmm. a boy standing on the sidelines, you know, noticing people around you and giving them well, attention did, and dignity. Did more than notice. They yeah. got him a Coke and a hamburger. Yeah. <laughs> And invited them to and, come on and over. It was all with the intent of drawing him out to yes. say, yeah, come on, yeah. Uh, come on over, join us. So amazing, though, because they were so busy doing what they were supposed to be doing mm -hmm. and yet stopped. You know, they stopped and took yeah. time. I love that. They noticed. Great story. Well, coming up, a missionary to Africa starts feeling sick and then collapses when he reaches the hospital. Every sign pointed to a deadly virus. I had to wear all the regalia just to walk in the room and be with him. There was no physical contact. I couldn't hold his hands. Um, any of the normal stuff that you would do on, on somebody's deathbed. See what brought her husband back after being given two or three hours left to live. His miraculous story is next, so stay with us. Matthew Murray looked into a hospital's CCTV camera and uttered what he thought were his last words. And as he lay dying on his deathbed, his wife Becky was trying to find the right way to break the news to their son. You know, how do I tell my little boy? My little boy was three at the time. How do I tell Josiah that daddy's not coming home? How do I call my mother-in-law and tell her that her son's not coming home? And Every dream and every promise that we believed over our lives just appearingly shattered on the floor. Matthew and Becky Murray of Great Britain met on a missions trip. For Becky, sight, uh, it wasn't love at first trip. sight. And uh, we had to pray for people. And I remember the whole team paired up really quickly. And the only person left was Matt. And I was like, oh, do not want to pray with this guy. And um, sure enough, we got put together, praying for the sick, and people were getting healed. And genuinely, my first thought about Matt was, well, it can't be that bad because God's using him. Soon, Matthew and Becky got married and sensed God beginning to speak to them. It was the first time I felt the Spirit of God speak to me. I'd been saved since a little girl, but I'd never heard the Spirit of God speak to my heart. And I felt him say that I would run a children's home and so it kept, literally, that was not the plan. I wanted to go and study law, um, but sure enough, he's got a better plan than what I had for my life. And so I was doing short-term missions trip for quite a long time until we started our own children's home in Kenya in 2012. King's Children's Home gives shelter to hundreds of kids that live in destitution on the streets of Kenya. They are well-fed, not just with food, but also by the Word of God. After visiting Kenya in 2014, Matthew and Becky made a fundraising trip to the United States, where Matthew began to feel sick. He just started with the usual symptoms of flu, and so he got the chills and a fever, and I remember giving him paracetamol and thinking, oh, you'll be fine, darling. And um, a few days went by and he just kept deteriorating and getting worse and worse, and so we went to the doctor. When they arrived, Matthew was placed in isolation for three days. 
Every sign pointed to a deadly virus. That was the first time we heard the words Ebola. Tragically, he had every symptom of it, and it was in the same week of the Ebola outbreak. Um, I had to wear all the regalia just to walk in the room and be with him. There was no physical contact. I couldn't hold his hands. Um, any of the normal stuff that you would do on, on somebody's deathbed. Alone in a foreign country, it was getting harder for Becky to cope with what the doctors were saying. And one of the really challenging moments was the doctor looked at me and she said, you can't go back to Kenya. She said, you've got a little boy at home who calls you mummy. He's already lost his daddy. And with tears, I just remember saying, but how can I not? How can I not go back? You see, I've got a hundred babies out there who call me mummy and call him daddy too. Finally, the doctors had a breakthrough with Matthew's diagnosis. Eventually they found out he had malaria and we were relieved. Oh, baby, a few days on tablets and you'll be fine. Um, we was diagnosed on the Thursday. On the Friday, the doctor pulled me in the room and she said, you have to know your husband's life's hanging in the balance. Um, she started talking about certain organs going into failure. And I remember just thinking, no, no, she, this can't be, you know? Um, and the doctor said, we've just had the pathology results back and actually his malaria levels have gone to 50%. Now I'm a nurse by background, and once your blood is half overtaken with a parasite, naturally speaking, there's no coming back from that. And um, she sat me down in a conference room and she said, he has maybe two or three hours left to live. Uh, we'll give him pain relief until he passes, but he's, it's gonna be a matter of hours. Becky knew that the only hope for Matthew was the power of prayer. So she sent out a Facebook post asking people to pray for her dying husband. Please pray for Matt, urgent. And uh, put my phone down and I'm just praying and just trying to pull myself together. And then I walked out of the room and this nurse beckoned me over and she had a big smile on her face. And I remember thinking she must not know what I've just been told. She said, I have no idea what's just taken place but we've just got a second lot of pathology results back and his malaria dro has dropped from 50 down to 10%. And I remember in that moment just thinking, oh my goodness, God is doing something here. God's doing something. Matthew's malaria levels went from 10% down to 5% and then finally to zero. His miraculous healing shook not just that hospital, but the entire medical community. Everyone was amazed at how this could have happened. Jesus promised me that he would never leave me or forsake me. So although the doctors didn't want to come near me, although the nurses were scared to touch me, Jesus was right there with me. And that's what faith is all about. There was another surprise in store for Matthew when he woke up. I sobbed like a little baby. I cried and cried and cried. When I, I picked up my phone, I looked at Facebook, I had 2,000 messages from people, strangers who I'd never even met saying, we were praying for you, our church was praying, we stood in the gap, we fasted, we prayed. I was humbled. I thought, wow, God, your church is the most incredible army on the planet to be mobilized so quickly to pray for someone they didn't even know. I thought, this is pretty incredible. If someone doubts in the power of prayer, <laughs> I would ask them to meet my husband. <laughs> because every doctor had given up on him. The doctors had done all they could with medicine and they did the best they could. They worked as hard as they could. But even the doctors acknowledged that this had to be a miracle because there is no explanation for Matthew's recovery. Today, Matthew and Becky run a ministry called One by One, and they continue to share their story of miraculous healing with people around the world. One of the nurses on the ICU unit actually gave her heart to Christ as a result of it because she saw firsthand, medicine didn't do this, God did this. You know, one of the things that I think of as I watch this, and you've often taught about this, the Tower of Babel and how God said, if they're unified, they can accomplish anything they desire. And it's like that with prayer, isn't it? that when we all powerfully unify together before the throne of God, uh, things happen that are impossible in the flesh, <laughs> in the natural. And that's what you saw in this case, just a mighty outpouring 
of people saying, God, we're, we're, we're asking your power to come down into this circumstance and to change things. That's the promise of Jesus. When yeah. two or more are gathered yeah. together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. And it's the, it's the key to manifestation of his presence. In him we live and move and have our being. He's always all around us. But that manifestation, when the light comes on, the power is released, Oof. it's when you have two or three saying yes. And so let's do that right now. Let's Amen. pray for you. We've got, we've got two right here. Terry and I are going to pray. You be the third one. Uh, and let's create a great circle of prayer. Just imagine everyone watching right now saying, yes, let's pray. If you have a need, let's bring your need. and You be the one to do that. And just be very specific with God. Uh, don't, don't ask a general prayer. If you need healing in your body, lay a hand on that area of the body that needs healing. If you need healing on your finances, pray over your financial condition. Need healing for your family, pray for that. Be very specific in what you're asking God for. If you don't have needs right now, amen, hallelujah, but join with us. Let's create that great circle of agreement. And in that unity, realize Jesus will be in our midst. And with him, there's no time, there's no distance. Uh, we're all one in him. So let's, let's hold on to that and let's believe that and let's pray. Mm -hmm. Lord, we gather together and we gather together in one accord with one purpose, and that is to seek your will and ask that your will would be done. And we see your will. We look to heaven and we see in heaven, there's no one sick, no one lonely, no one estranged, no one poor. We see righteousness, we see peace, we see joy. And so we pray right now that your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we pray for people who are laying hands on areas of the body right now. We come into agreement with them. And we ask that your power would flow through their hands and into their body and they would be healed now in Jesus' name. For those who are praying for family, for those who are estranged from family, we just come into agreement with that, them and say, let love reign supreme. Let love, forgiveness, reconciliation reign supreme. For those who are praying for their finances, we just ask that you would provide all their need according to your riches and glory. Thank you, Lord. Mm -hmm. And I just want to say, Janet or Jan uh, Janelle, um, God has heard your cry. I don't believe your need is a physical, um, medical need of any kind, but he has heard it, and the answer is in process. Trust him. Someone with recurring sinus infections and sinus headaches over your um, it's primarily uh, over the left eye and over the bridge of the nose. God has healed you and restored all of that. All of that affection is leaving you now in Jesus' name. All that swelling inflammation be gone now. And no more headaches, no more pain now in Jesus' name. Someone else with um, strained neck muscles, um, mm -hmm. primarily on the right side, uh, and, and you're, you're, you're just sort of, asking right now, are you talking about me? Because you didn't even have a hand on it. God is talking about you. He's healing you right now, restoring you. Someone else with trouble with your um, uh, pancreas, and God is healing. He's able to restore insulin production. He's able to restore blood production. He's able to restore that organ now. In Jesus' name, be healed. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for being in our midst, being Emmanuel, God with us, working through us, working together with us. Lord, we thank you for that. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. If you have been touched by God, if you've been healed, let us know. Give us a call, 1-800-700-7000. And we believe in prevailing prayer. If you need someone to agree with you in prayer, we're here for you 24 hours a day. All you have to do is pick up the phone and call. Well, still to come, see how one man is sharing the good news with millions around the world. Evangelist Rob Welch joins us live when we come back.
In 2002, Rob Welch left the business world, sold his home, and enrolled in a master's program at Wheaton College. He received his master's degree in missions, but never imagined just how far that would take him. Take a look. While training at the Billy Graham Center in 2004, Rob Welch decided to help churches promote, train, and equip new believers. Since 2006, he started using large festivals to do just that. God has led us to minister in cities with hundreds of churches where the church leaders are seeking God to transform their cities and their region and their nation with the gospel. Since then, he's held these meetings in 12 countries with more than 500,000 people making decisions for Christ. Well, joining me now is evangelist Rob Welch. And Rob, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me here, Gordon. You were praying over a map of the world and God gave you a vision. Tell us about that. Yeah, I was at uh, my church and I was looking at this world atlas and I really felt the Lord impress onto my heart, one world, one Lord, one gospel. And that's really become a vision for our ministry. I certainly didn't know all the details then, but that certainly is what God is has called me to, and we're seeing him do. Well, he always lays down the big vision, and then you get to walk out the details. <laughs> That's right. Um, my contract. And <laughs> <laughs> but it does change your thought process when you really see it God's way, that this is all one world. We make a big deal about all our differences, but in his view, well, you're, they're all my children. That's right. I, uh, what, what was your first trip? My first trip was to Uganda in 2003. I mm -hmm. went with a friend, uh, Kalara Rooney, who's from Uganda, and I ministered in Western Uganda, and it was a life-changing experience for me. We saw over 300 people come to faith in Christ, got to preach, got to minister, really saw God move in power, and God just really gave me such a love uh, for the continent of Africa and the people of Africa. Is that your primary mission field? Right now it is. Uh, we've ministered in India seven times as well, mm. and other countries also been in South America, and Mexico and but right now our main focus is in Africa. That's where our ministry team is and that's really where all of our large scale efforts are right now. When you go on the stage, um, when, when you go on the platform is probably a better way to put it. Uh, what, what's your number one prayer? What are you thinking in that moment? Well, I just want God to speak because I know I have nothing to add. And there have been times where there was way too much of me up there, and it's like a slow-moving train wreck on Jumbotron. So, so I just want God to speak. I just want to be surrendered. I want the Holy Spirit to speak through me. I want the gospel to be clear. It's just one message. Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world. He came. He took our sins on the cross, died in our place, rose from the dead, and he's calling people to believe on him and be saved. So I just want God to speak through me and God to draw everyone there to himself. When you were growing up, did you ever imagine that you would be doing this? Never. What, what, what was your dream growing up? I, well, I thought I was going to have my own business, mm -hmm. and that was the direction I thought I was going. And I say I thought because, you know, you start with your plans, and God's kind of like, that's nice, but yeah. here's what I have for you. God, God will laugh at your plans. <laughs> I'm sure you understand. <laughs> I do. <laughs> I didn't want to have anything to do with ministry. I, no, I, I was the rebel. I was the black sheep son. And I, I went right away to do my own thing. And then God got a hold of well, me. Well, it's a hard deal, I think, in your role, too, just with your father being as famous as he is. And God calling you, kind of like Franklin, probably. You can, there's some you can look at it that way, but you can also look at it. What a great opportunity. Oh, it is. And I'll tell my kids um, that. That's a much better way to look at it. It's a great opportunity. And how can you take it further? Amen. Um, don't, I'm praying that don't, for my kids. Don't turn away from it. Embrace it. Um, Amen. I spent a lot of years trying to prove I wasn't Pat Robertson's son, which is really hard to prove when you are. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, embrace it. Embrace it Amen. and live it and say, yes, this is me. Amen. Uh, God had a purpose. Amen. What's your dream now? What do you want to do now? Well, really, our, our vision, our mission is to see movements launched to transform nations for Christ. Mm hmm so I just want to see more of that, you know, God opening bigger doors. The last three and a half years, we've really seen the ministry take off, and we're seeing movements launched that should end up reaching millions for Christ. So we want to see nations transformed and see more and more doors open to train and equip others 
to now, multiply. When, when you say movements, spell that out. What, oh, what are you talking about? Disciple making movements. Good, good clarification question. Our focus is on launching disciple making movements. We're really spiritual midwives used by the Holy Spirit serving churches, pastors, and believers to launch multiplying movements. So we're training and equipping believers to multiply in small groups like you see in the book of Acts. Mm -hmm. And that's really what we're doing. The festival is just the Pentecost, the huge in-gathering. It's easiest to explain, but everything that we're about is the Great Commission and making disciples who make disciples. So that's, that's what we want to see. We want to see cities transform, see movements birthed out of cities, go to several cities in a nation, see movements launched out of those cities, see the nation transformed and beyond, and God's opening bigger and bigger doors. So we just want to see that multiply. And, and that's why you go in advance. Yes. You're there to train trainers. Yes, there are several trips that take place before the festival, and that's really to prepare the disciple makers and to start the disciple making process in small groups. We want to see a movement launch, and you've got to get to the fourth generation of discipleship groups before it's a self-sustaining movement. So we want to be as close to that as possible possible by the time of the festival. Mm -hmm. Because if you have a movement launch, you're just about to launch, then you're ready to receive the tens or hundreds of thousands of people yeah, that are there and responding. You're ready to yeah. bring in the harvest. We'll bring in the harvest to Absolutely. someplace and not just and harvest multiply. and leave them in the field. Absolutely. If someone's watching right now and they want to get involved, how can they? Well, uh, the first thing I'd say is go to our website, forhisglorymen.org. That's F-O-R-H-I-S-G-L-O-R-Y-M-I-N.org. You see it on the screen as well. Okay. All right. Well, if you want to check out, just go to that same website. And Rob, thanks for being with us. God bless you. Thank you. Here's a verse from Mark. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Rob did it. He left business to do it. You can do it too. God bless you. We'll see you again.